A lady was picking through the frozen turkeys at the grocery store, but couldn't find one that was big enough for her family. She finally asked a stock boy, do these turkeys get any bigger? No, ma'am, the stock boy replied, they're dead. <laughs> the policeman got out of his car and the kid who was stopped for speeding rolled down his window. I've been waiting for you all day, the police officer said. And the kid replied, yeah, well, I got here as fast as I could. <laughs> A truck driver was driving along the freeway. A sign comes up that reads, Low Bridge Ahead. Before he knows it, the bridge is right ahead of him, and he gets stuck under the bridge. Cars are backed up for miles. Finally, a police car comes up. The policeman gets out of the car, walks around to the truck driver, puts his hands on his hips, and says, Got stuck, huh? The truck driver responds, No, sir. I was just delivering this bridge and ran out of gas. Sometimes it just doesn't pay to have an answer. The truth is, we don't always have the answers, do we? We live, and you know what I mean when I say this, we live in a noisy world. We live in a world that is filled with distractions of all kinds, and sometimes those distractions will keep us from hearing that which we need to Back when the telegraph was the fastest means of long-distance communication, a young man applied for a job as a Morse code operator. Answering an ad in the newspaper, he went to the address that was listed. When he arrived, he found a large and noisy office. In the background, the telegraph clicked away. The sign on the receptionist counter instructed job applicants to fill out the form and wait until they were summoned into the inner office. The young man completed the form and sat down with seven other waiting applicants. After a few minutes, the young man stood up, crossed the room to the door to the inner office, walked right in. Well, naturally, the other applicants perked up, wondering what in the world was going on. Why had this guy been so bold? They muttered among themselves they hadn't heard any summons yet. They took more than a little satisfaction in assuming the young man went into the office and he would be reprimanded for his presumption and disqualified for the job. Within a few moments, the young man emerged from the inner office, escorted by the interviewer, who announced to the other applicants, gentlemen, thank you very much for coming, but the young man has taken this job. It's been given to him. The other applicants began to grumble to one another, and then one finally spoke up and said, wait a minute, I don't understand something here. He was the last one to come in, and we never even had a chance to be interviewed, and yet he got the job. That's just not fair. The employer responded, I'm sorry, but all the time you've been sitting here, the telegraph has been ticking a message in Morse code. It said, if you understand this message, Come right in. The job is yours. None of you heard it or understood it. He did, so the job is his. Well, God doesn't speak to us in code, but we still have a challenge to recognize God is at work, and we have a challenge to recognize, to listen to his voice, even when we're distracted by things, and perhaps most especially, when we're distracted by suffering and pain. We started this little journey last week, and we're going to conclude this morning with purpose in pain from John's Gospel, the ninth chapter, beginning with verse 1. John chapter 9 and verse 1, purpose in pain, and I'll invite you to stand as we read together. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. 
So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. Thank you so much. You may be seated. For those of you who were not here last week, and your names will appear on the screen momentarily, I want to take just a moment or two to review what we dealt with just to catch you up to speed so that we can all move ahead together. We noted from the text last week from verse 1, Jesus sees the pain of every person. It's true, you know, Jesus sees the pain of every person. And we noted that Phillips Brooks had been credited as having said, if you preach to hurting people, you'll never lack for a congregation. We believe that's true. Secondly, we noted it is human nature to assign blame and Christians aren't exempt from the process. Remember we talked about how oftentimes people, even believers, will look at another family going through a great difficulty and wonder, what did they do to deserve that? Why are they going through that? I wonder what happened in their home that made this or this thing happen. And then we talked about how, thirdly, there is always a reason for the pain we face. We noted three things, two that are very palatable, one not so much. We noted, first of all, that some things happen so that the work of God may be displayed. That's what the account here in the Gospel of John makes clear. And then we talked about how some things happen because we simply live in a fallen world, and then the one that was not so palatable yet true, some things happen because we're stupid. Now, lest you think I'm unkind, talk to somebody that was here last week, and they'll explain that it was not an unkind remark. Fourthly, we noted pain presents opportunity for ministry from verses 4 and 5. Remember, it's no coincidence that Jesus' words come at this point. There is oftentimes a correlation between our pain and our usefulness in the kingdom of God. I gave you two quotes before we departed. One from A.W. Tozer who said, God cannot use a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And then Alan Redpath said, When God wants to do an impossible task... He takes an impossible person and crushes him. So let's dig in. Number one this morning, I want you to recognize Jesus does his part in helping us in our pain. And often we're called to do something as well. Jesus does his part, but oftentimes we're called upon to do something as well. Look with me at verse 6. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. In the Gospel of Mark, there is also a record of an incident where Jesus healed a man in the very same way. Some see the significance in the saliva. Some people believed in ancient world, in the ancient times, that saliva of a distinguished person had certain curative qualities. Well, I don't think for what it's worth. I don't think that's the big deal here. Although, if somebody is going to anoint my eyes with dirt and spit, I would just as soon it be Jesus as anybody else. I think it has much more to do with the lordship of Jesus. The fact that Jesus was, in fact, Lord over the dirt, and Jesus was Lord over the saliva, and Jesus was Lord over the man's blindness. He could even turn common dirt and saliva into the medium of restoration. He could use anything he wanted to. So Jesus does his part to help the man in his pain. In this story, God uses saliva. We know that sometimes God heals through compassion of others. You've had the experience where someone has spoken an encouraging word to you and you've experienced some perhaps emotional healing. We also know that oftentimes God uses the knowledge of doctors to bring about healing. Sometimes we are helped with pain through the kind words of friends. We sense the peace and the presence of God in that way. But in the ultimate sense, we know that Jesus did his part to bring us healing by going to the cross. So we know he did his part. A while back, I had a little medical issue, and the doctor gave me medicine. The doctor did his part. My part was what? To take the medicine. It's not rocket science. The key is, sometimes, although God does what he needs to do and wants to do, sometimes there's something that we're called upon to do as well. 
Here the man is told to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam was a small pool that essentially allowed water to flow through the city. It was, in fact, a sort of conduit. The water was sent through it, thus the name. But Siloam can also mean not only sent, but can also be representative of he who has been sent. What a picture. How Jesus must have identified with that picture in that moment. He had been sent, and now he is, in fact, sending the man. The man was called upon to do something. But I've read this, and I've oftentimes wondered, what if Jesus had anointed the man's eyes with this mud and said, go now and wash in the pool of Siloam? What if the man had said, no, I'm not going to do that? It is frustrating to me how often people say they want help, but won't oftentimes do what's necessary to really be helped. It begs the question, would he have been healed or remained healed had he not followed the instruction of Jesus? Part of the issue is people have a hard time admitting that we need help. Isn't it true? Even to our closest confidants, it's difficult to, in conversation, simply say, I'm going through a really, really hard time, and I need help. What if, what if, like we sometimes are, this man had been in denial? Can you imagine? What if he had said, blind? I'm not blind. And yet oftentimes I know Christians that say, bitter? I'm not bitter. Angry? I'm not angry. Confused? I, I, I'm not confused. A fellow pastor sent me a message just this morning around 6 o'clock. And he asked me to pray for him, and then he said he would pray for me in return. Now, you may wonder, what do pastors want to be prayed about um, at 6 o'clock in the morning? He said, what would you like for me to pray for? And I said, pray that I'll be faithful to Jesus and the gospel. You say, Ken, you're a pastor. You had your sermon written. You know that you were going to be faithful to teach and preach and do that, right? Well, let me tell you, you might say, why, why did you tell him that? I told him that because just like the old song says, I know my heart. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Jesus did his part. This man had to do his. In the ultimate sense, our standing with God is explained that way. Jesus did his part on the cross and through the resurrection. Our part is simply accepting, that is, receiving the gift of eternal life. So Jesus does his part in helping us in our pain, and often we're called upon to do something as well. Secondly, I want you to recognize, when people see the way you process your pain, they'll begin asking questions. When people see what you're dealing with, they will begin asking questions. Now look with me beginning with verse 8. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? When I was a kid, I used to go to the horse races with my uncle Al. I can remember the afternoons that we would go to the horse races, he would pick up a paper, racing form, and we would pour over that racing form, check out the odds. When we would go to the, to the uh, racetrack, he would always buy me a Coke. It's funny the things you remember from childhood. And the Cokes at the racetrack were always really, really syrupy. Now, don't judge me because I went to the racetrack. I was just a kid. And I saw some of you there, too. It was a fun time, and those are great memories. And I always remember my Uncle Al picking the ugliest horse to win. All the other horses would come in. They were marching thoroughbreds, and in comes the old gray mare. You know what I mean? He always picked the ugliest horse. Well, one day he came to our house, and he said, he looked down at me, and he was very serious, and he said, Ken, Uncle Al won't be able to go to the races anymore. I don't think it's right for me to gamble anymore. You see, son, I've become a Christian. Now, horse racing is not high on the list of mortal sins, but he felt like he needed to give it up. So he did. He gave that up, and in fact, he stopped a lot of other habits. The way that he talked and the way he conducted himself from that moment he trusted in Jesus changed. 
He was a changed man. Now, I'm going to sound preachy for a moment. It's time that the church change. It's time that we look a bit differently than the world, don't you think? I'm afraid, and this may be, you may argue the point and say, well, it's a generational thing, but I'm afraid that in all of our attempts to reach our culture, in all the different ways that we strive to identify with our culture, I'm afraid that we in the church are giving in to the standards, not of the Lord, but of the culture. We're afraid to strive for purity outside of the songs that we sing. Nobody talks about holiness. Who talks about holiness? Who talks about righteousness? It sounds too churchy. But it is what it is, after all. It's like we're afraid they'll find out we belong to the church. And then we're responsible. Or we're afraid they'll find out we belong to Jesus. Well, we do. And let me be very clear. I'm not talking about joining the odd for God crowd. Christians are strange. Look around. We're an odd bunch. Did you guys read just this past week? I think it was Kenneth Copeland came out and said that if Christians don't all vote for Donald Trump, the wrath of God is going to fall upon the church. And he named several things that we were going to be struck with. What I'm saying, don't, don't join the... Uh, Christians are strange. It's a strange bunch. What I'm saying is when the office crowd wants you to tie one on with them, don't do it. But don't be content to just not get drunk with them. Tell them why you don't do that. Allow your actions and then your words to explain that your behavior is a direct result of your life having been given to Jesus. I remember talking to a friend whose nephew had just come back from college, and this kid knew the truth of the Bible. He came back with all kinds of ideas about the world and about a couple of particular hot-button social issues. He's done an about-face from what he was taught in his church, and the people around him, even so-called Christians, were saying, well, it's good that you're stretching your mind, son, and that you're not just accepting what you've been taught. That's a crock, frankly. Now, I, don't, don't get me wrong. I love education. I'm all in favor of education. But just because you become well-educated doesn't mean you have to forsake that which is true and foundational and making a difference in your life. Somebody needs to tell this kid that just because some so-called enlightened professor thinks Jesus is an antiquated figment of some religious imagination doesn't make it so. And parenthetically, I'll take a BA over a PhD any day as long as the B.A. stands for born again. Listen, I've talked to Jesus about this, and he doesn't want to be relegated to just one of the boys. God is not the man upstairs. God is not whomever you want him to be. We don't have the luxury of taking his word and looking at it and changing it just because it doesn't fit our culture anymore. God is not that. It's not Jesus and Buddha and crystals and Freud that will change your life. You and I, let me just be clear, you and I don't suffer from self-esteem problems or from a bruised ego. We're what the Bible calls sinners. Now, you may have a self-esteem problem and a bruised ego too, but we are born with our backs toward God, and we like it that way. And until we give in to Jesus, we are just as messed up as the rest of the planet. So people see the change and then they wonder if this is even the same guy. Some think it's just a look-alike. What a great picture for us. Wouldn't it be awesome? Wouldn't this be so great if people would have to wonder whether or not we are who they actually thought we were? What if we were so changed that they would look at us and it would be hard to believe it was really us? How many of you have gone through a tragedy and those around you have asked, how do you do it? How are you holding up so well? You see, it's not, it's not that we don't hurt, because we do. It's just that we have faith in a God who walks through our hurts with us. God doesn't take them all away. In fact, and it's a hard thing to think through, but it's true, 
in this account, even if Jesus had not healed the man, he would still be God. So Jesus does his part in helping us in our pain, and often we're called upon to do something as well. When people see the way you process your pain, they'll begin asking questions. Thirdly, even during and after pain, we can point people to Jesus. Verse 11, he answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. I have a good friend named Tim Dietrich. Some of you may recall Tim came and preached here a few years ago for us. Several years ago, his dad was diagnosed with cancer, and Tim sent out an email asking people to pray. He was in pain for his father, but he was pointing people to Jesus to pray. A few weeks later, I received a note from Tim that read as follows. As you know, my dad had a biopsy on his esophagus on June 28th, which revealed he had cancer. This was confirmed by a CT scan and that was performed on July 6th. Yesterday, he underwent a second evaluation, and the doctors have concluded his cancer is gone. They find no evidence of any cancer in his esophagus. The doctors did another series of biopsies to confirm their findings, but they were confident there is no cancer in his esophagus and stomach. He continues, obviously, we are rejoicing that our Heavenly Father has moved in such a miraculous and gracious way. On behalf of my family, I want to thank you for your prayers, which touched the heart of our great God. We are deeply moved by God's goodness and grace. As you have time today, please take a moment and thank God for this miracle. Now, how many times have we asked people to pray and then the thing ends up turning out the way we've been praying for, and we've missed opportunities to offer God thanks. And we've missed opportunities to point people again to Jesus. How many people, even Christians in this case, would have said, well, I guess the doctors just missed it the first time. Or I wonder if those tests were somehow distorted. They, they probably just didn't see it clearly. My friend Tim's dad died earlier this year. And do you know what he did? He sent out another note, and he asked people to take a moment and thank God for giving his dad life in the first place. Sometimes things don't work out the way we would like. Can I get a witness? I mean, sometimes things don't work out the way we want them to. But I want you to know that when terrible things happen, we can still rely on God. And we don't have to have all the answers, do we? In fact, last night about 11 o'clock, this thought came to me as I was mulling all of this around in my mind. And here it is. Having faith doesn't mean having answers. Having faith doesn't mean having all the answers. Like you, I grieved for the Schwab family after their 10-year-old son Caleb was killed while riding a water slide at Schlitterbahn. I saw part of what Caleb's dad had said at his funeral, and I thought, I can't believe how strong this guy is. You may have seen some of his quotes. Scott Schwab said, Since the day he was born, he brought abundant joy to our family and all those he came in contact with. As we try to mend our home with him no longer with us, we are comforted knowing he believed in our Savior Jesus, and they are forever together now. We will see him another day. They don't have the answer as to why all of this happened, but they're doing what we should all do when tragedy strikes. They're running to Jesus. Having faith doesn't mean having the answers. There are, there's a case of uh, using painful circumstances. They're helping people in their pain to deal with their pain. How often we miss the blessing because we think, I don't know enough about the Bible. I'm not well versed enough in theology. I'm not a church leader. I'm not good enough to talk about this. I might, I might actually say the wrong thing. But the man in the Bible is healed, and what does he do? He says, this guy named Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud. I was blind, but now I see. End of story. And like the country song said a few years ago, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. People ask me all the time, Pastor, why, why did this have to happen? When I was a younger man, I would 
scramble to try to come up with a brilliant response because I thought I had to have something to say, and now I'm a little bit wiser, and I say, I don't know. Pastor, why did this have to happen? I don't know. I don't know. We have two dogs in our house now. We have Maggie the Great, and we have Bo the Orphan, who was our son's dog, and that's a story for another day. <laughs> we don't know Maggie's story. We rescued her from a pet shelter. Now, those of you that have seen, seen Maggie, you know she's a beautiful dog, but she eats like a horse. She's loud when she sleeps because she snores. I mean, the china vibrates when this dog sleeps, and she is stubborn like you would not believe. She takes after Lori's side of the family. <laughs> but sometimes when, when she plays outside, sometimes when she's done very much walking or running, she limps. She limps. I, I think now probably that's why somebody gave her up but I don't know what has caused the limp, but I've noticed that when she limps, my heart goes out to her. I'm worried about her. And in those times, I find myself paying more attention to her and wanting her to know how much I really do love her and I'm always gonna be there for her and I'm looking out for her. I have a limp, and you do too. It's our pain our heartache. And I promise you, if you'll be still in the middle of it, God will show up wanting you to know how much he loves you, reminding you that he's always going to be there for you, and he's always, always looking out for you. Fourthly and finally, you don't have to have all the answers to impact your corner of the world. Verse 12 they said to him, where is he? And he said, I do not know. Now you'd think that, that the man who had just been healed would know where the man who had healed him had actually gone. You don't have to have all of the answers to impact your corner of the world. For those of you who are Christ followers, why did Jesus allow you to become a Christian? Why in the world are you so blessed? Why is it that with probably half the world starving, we get three meals a day and probably most anything we want? Why is it we are allowed to live in a country with such freedom? I don't know. No doubt this guy was around those who were still not well. Maybe there were even other blind people in the vicinity, and they asked, where is this man Jesus? And he said, I don't know. How come he didn't heal everybody? I don't know. This is a little practical theology lesson that I know I need, and you might need it too, because the crowd is going to ask you, where was God on 9-11? Where was God when that little boy went down that slide and lost his life? Where is God when we have soldiers overseas? Where is God when little children have to go to bed hungry or face diseases? Where's the justice in our world? Where is God? Well, here's the truth. We don't have all the answers, but we don't need them. God's not on trial. People who ask these questions don't have the answers either. The man in our story didn't have all the answers, but they saw what had happened to him. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not saying that the Christian faith is anti-intellectual. It's not. It's just that you cannot explain everything supernatural with human wisdom. Think about what we believe. We believe that the creator God of the universe left the glory of heaven, robed up in flesh, lived as a common rabbi and carpenter, gave his life on a cross, and after three days, this carpenter, dead carpenter, got up and walked. <laughs> we believe that. It's not that faith defies logic. It's just that faith goes so far beyond it. So what I can say to you this morning is this. I don't understand all your pain, but I know a loving God who does, 
And he is deeply concerned about you at this very moment. You don't have to have all the answers. But you do need to be related to the God who does. Karl Barth was an eminent theologian of the 20th century. His his writing, Church Dogmatics, among others, would fill up volumes in libraries. He was brilliant. Dr. Barth had traveled the world. He had written countless theological works. He had studied and taught the brightest students the world over. Once, while being interviewed, he was asked to synthesize all that he had learned from his travels and his study and his teaching. When he was asked about the mysteries of life, Karl Barth responded as follows. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So. 